Hello everyone. Warm greetings from Costa Rica. I want to thank the organizers of this gathering for inviting me to address you today. I'm happy to share with you some reflections about the Earth Charter. My hope is that this sharing will inspire you to engage with it and use it in your own context. 19 years ago, on the 29th of June 2000, the Earth Charter was launched at the Peace Palace in The Hague in the Netherlands. This was a major event that brought together key leaders of this movement. Morris Strong, Mikhail Gorbachev, Ruud Lubbers, Wangari Matai, and Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands. But this initiative did not start there. It actually is an idea, or the Earth Charter idea started back in 87, when the Brundtland Commission uh, issued their report, Our Common Future, and in that report they made a call for the need of a new charter, a new charter to guide states in the transition to sustainable development. This recommendation was then taken to the preparatory process of the 92 Rio Earth Summit. So, in that context of the UN Conference of uh, Environment and Development in 92, a number of consultations and negotiations took place to draft such a charter. But there was no political will to agree on such a strong statement under that UN framework and that time frame. Following the Earth Summit in 92, Morris Strong, who was the UN Secretary General of the Earth Summit, got together with Mikhail Gorbachev, who was also interested in working on something similar. They were both interested in elevating the importance of ethics in the global arena. In this collective effort, they also involved Ruud Lubbers, who was the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Jim McNeil, who was the Secretary of the Brundtland Commission, and they joined forces to launch a new effort to move forward with the idea of the Earth Charter. At that point, the idea was to make it a global ethical framework. They were visionaries in the sense that they did not see this process limited to governments, nor just an intergovernmental process of negotiations. Precisely because of the limitations and interests that normally emerge within that sphere, but rather they saw the importance of engaging various actors, not only to get their voices, but also in engaging them in helping to realize this vision, engaging them in helping to make that into a new movement uh, towards social transformation. I think this is really an interesting thing, especially for that moment. I mean, the fact that this time at that time, back in 94, when they got together, this initiative was not dependent on a UN negotiation process, but it was really a civil society process involving experts in different fields, grassroots organizations, indigenous people, and also world leaders, allowing probably more room and creativity, allowing more richness in this process. It's really quite something to think that they thought outside the box of the UN framework or UN negotiations and engaging this broad movement or engaging individuals and organizations from this broad movement. This new phase began in '94 with an initial consultation, especially initial consultations uh, in engaging organizations and with a workshop that was held in May '95, also in The Hague to start identify international instruments, already existing international instruments, that could serve as the basis of the Earth Charter. And at that moment, they also started to design how that broad consultation process should take place. Stephen Rockefeller was invited to chair the drafting committee at that time. Uh, I had the fortune to facilitate the consultation process that took place in many countries in all regions of the world, uh, involving individuals and groups from various areas of knowledge. Following that, a Nurse Charter Commission was formed to oversee the consultation and drafting process. The first meeting of the Commission took, took place in March 97 during the Rio Plus Five Forum held in Brazil. A first draft of the Earth Charter 
was released at the end of this forum as a result of two to three years research work and to serve as the basis for further consultation. That was just the first draft of the Rostrata that was launched in March 97. To ensure uh, diversity, to ensure cultural diversity, but also diversity in areas of knowledge. So the Rostrata is actually the result of this worldwide multicultural and multisectoral consultation and dialogue that took place for about six years during the decade of the 90s. This was a major effort to identify, through a participatory process, what were our widely shared values and principles that could frame a vision and guide humanity towards a more just, sustainable and peaceful world. Since the launch of the Earth Charter in the year 2000, so the launch was really in June 2000, it has been widely disseminated and used. Uh, the Earth Charter has been translated in about 65 languages. We continue to emphasize the importance to look at the Earth Charter as an important instrument and ethical reference, an important instrument to further stimulate dialogue. Not just to look at it or not to look at it as a dogma or anything to be imposed. We continue to stress that the Earth Charter can be used to stimulate ethical reflection, to stimulate dialogue. It can be used to guide our decisions, to put us in the direction uh, towards a more just and sustainable world. So now, the Earth Charter can be considered as a document, uh, an international movement, and as an organization. As a document, the Earth Charter is a declaration of interdependence and responsibility that articulates the values and principles of sustainability. It is a guide, or can be seen as a guide, an ethical reference, and a framework for building a just, sustainable, and peaceful global society. I see the Earth Charter as an ethical compass towards a more caring, respectful, and responsible civilization. I see it as an ethical compass for those many decisions we make as in individuals, professionals, and as institutions. As an instrument, I see really as an instrument to help us navigate through these difficult decisions, navigate through many dilemmas in our daily lives and decisions. It helps us to think of the consequences and impacts of our decisions. The ideas and principles articulated in their charter are drawn from various sources. Its development was really influenced by the growing literature on global ethics. It was influenced by the new scientific worldview, which emphasizes the notion of interdependence of all life. If you see principle one of the Earth Charter, it affirms the importance to recognize that all beings are interdependent and every form of life has value regardless of its worth to human beings. The Earth Charter also reflects the wisdom of the world's religion and philosophical traditions. It reflects also the voice of the social movements associated with human rights, democracy, gender equality, disarmament and peace. The purpose of this do document is to help us expand and deepen our understanding on what it takes to live in a more sustainable world. It helps us to understand or to expand our consciousness with regards to our relationship to the large living world. It seeks to cultivate a new earth ethic that places the notion of care for the community of life at the center of our lifestyles and at the center of our decisions. The Earth Charter starts with a preamble that emphasizes the current global challenges and emphasizes the importance of universal responsibility. It has 16 principles and many supporting principles, all organized around four parts. The first is respect and care for the community of life. The second is ecological integrity. The third part of their charter, the third pillar of their charter, is social and economic justice. And the fourth, democracy, nonviolence, and peace. Mainly, it is uh, very important for us to realize that the Earth Charter emphasizes the interconnections and interdependence of all these four dimensions. The four parts of the Earth Charter are to be seen 
through the lenses of really a, a system. It are, because it articulates in a way a systemic approach to life. At the heart of their charter lies an ethic of care and respect for the community of life. Principle two states the importance to care for the community of life with understanding, uh, compassion, and love. As a movement, the Rashara involves individuals and organizations from 89 countries that have embraced and have adopted the Rashara and are using it in many creative ways. These are schools, universities, city governments, NGOs, and business institutions that see the value of the Earth Charter to their own context and their sphere of work. These are groups and individuals from around the world interested in contributing to social transformation and in being part of a global movement that is contributing to the transition to sustainability. The fact is uh, that we urgently need to elevate people's understanding on the impact of human actions in the well-being of communities and in the life on the planet, all life in the planet. Uh, we also need to stimulate a sense of responsibility of all of that. So the Earth Charter movement makes an effort to address all of this through these lenses of system thinking and also through the angle of uh, ethics and values. Let me give you one example of these groups uh, that have adopted and are using the Earth Charter. It's the example of Itaipu. Itaipu is the biggest hydroelectric power plant in Brazil. It's a state-owned enterprise. In fact, it is an enterprise owned by Brazil and Paraguay together. Itaipu produces approximately 80% of the electricity in Paraguay and approximately 20% of the electricity in Brazil. In 2003, when they were looking for instruments to guide them in the development of their environment and social responsibility program, they found the Earth Charter and decided to adopt it and use it as the basis of their work on social environment responsibility. They engaged with community leaders from 29 municipalities that surround the power plant, which is a huge area. No? It's also a huge collaborative program to, that focuses in the protection of the watershed and river, river bank of a huge area that's in the southern part of Brazil. They developed participatory workshops to sensitize the community to commit to reforestation and the protection of river banks um, and the watershed in that area. They commit themselves to engage in many other activities, collaborative activities. The Earth Charter has been their inspiration. The Earth Charter has been their main ethical compass and education instrument in this effort. It's a wonderful example and you can find more information about that if you Google Itaipu and Earth Charter. The purpose of the Earth Charter as a movement is to ensure that the vision expressed in the Earth Charter becomes a reality everywhere. But the Earth Charter can also be seen as an institution. Uh, the Earth Charter International Secretariat is set up in Costa Rica and functions as a hub for this global movement, engaging people and organizations, facilitating the process, getting stories of good practices and experiences in using the Earth Charter, and sharing it widely. We also established a Earth Charter Education Center, which is located on the campus of the University for Peace. The center coordinates a UNESCO chair on education for sustainable development, which is based on the Earth Charter, and much of the work we do revolves around the implementation of uh, educational programs, courses, uh, training, workshops, and also involves uh, research activities surrounding that intersection of, between education, sustainability, and ethics, using their charter as our foundation or as of our framework. The many programs uh, we offer mainly to engage young leaders, uh, local uh, communities, and uh, educators. Our programs are aimed at uh, mainly at educators and young leaders. 
uh, it, we place a special emphasis on the importance to infuse values and principles of sustainability and global citizenship in processes of learning and processes of decision making. Uh, for instance, through the online and face-to-face -face courses we offer, we are mostly focused on seeking to enhance um, the educator's capacity, or the educators or the education institution capacity to incorporate the knowledge, values and principles needed for a sustainable way of life. Uh, incorporate that in schools, in colleges and higher education, but also incorporate that in non-formal education. For instance, we offer professional development opportunities to educators on education for sustainability and we also have a program to engage youth in strengthening their capacity to become ethical leaders. We do that through a short online course uh, uh, targeting young people from uh, between 18 and 30 years old, uh, old and the short course is called Leadership, Sustainability and Ethics. Next year, we'll be celebrating the 20th anniversary since the launch of the Earth Charter. For that, we plan to organize a number of activities uh, with the purpose to strengthen and expand this movement. I encourage you all to engage in this movement as you can. Thinking that the challenges of unsustainability we currently face with growing social disparities, violence, corruption, and the ecological crisis is really a challenge that is rooted in a worldview that is reductionist, fragmented, and short-sighted, and that stimulates mostly individualism, self-interest, and materialism. This is a predominant worldview, and it's a worldview that results in a lack of commitment and responsibility uh, to the common good commitment and responsibility to contribute to the well-being of present and future generations. Therefore, I think we need to really offer space, generate spaces, uh, to examine our worldview, to examine our assumptions and values, and in that process the Earth Charter can be used as a wonderful reference. Let me end here with an invitation for you to look at the Earth Charter, dig into it, get familiar with it, use it as an educational instrument and as a tool to stimulate dialogue. And I hope you can see it as an ethical reference and as a guide for your decision as an individual or as an institution. See it as an ethical compass. I invite you to go uh, to our website and express your endorsements to your shot. You can do that online. Um, and I really wish you a great success and a wonderful event. Thank you.